draw your attention this morning, this afternoon, to the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 24. And this afternoon we're going to be looking at verses 15 through 18 from the book that we love. Matthew 24, 15 through 18. And here in this text, Christ is going to be teaching us a very important lesson about how what really matters, the gospel, is going to cost us everything. Matthew 24, beginning at verse 15, says, So when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not come down to get things out of his house. And a man in the field must not go back to get his quote, coat. People of God, this is the word of God. Join me in a word of prayer. And so, Father, we come before you again this morning to thank you for your grace and goodness. To hear from you, to be reminded of the covenant of grace, the gospel, of those truths that bring assurance and peace and contentment to our souls, to our hearts and minds. And Lord, we ask that as we hear your word, that that's exactly what would happen, that by your spirit, you would bring illumination, conviction, and even admonition, Lord, in areas where we need it. Father, I pray for myself. I ask the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart will be pleasing in your sight. I ask, Lord, that you forgive me my own imperfections in this most holy task of preaching your word. I thank you for the privilege, and I ask that you give me unction to preach it. And most of all, I thank you for him in whose name I come. And with somebody who loves him, shout, amen. amen. You may be seated in his presence. Now, we all know the illustration of the man who's hanging on for dear life on the edge of a cliff. And he's holding on with one hand to a branch, holding on for dear life. And with, in the other hand, he's holding on to a, a briefcase full of money, all the money that he saved up his entire life. And another man comes along and, and he sees him there and, and he runs over and he reaches down and he says, he says, let go of that briefcase and give me your hand. And he's, the man says, no way. He's like, if I'm going to be saved, it's going to be with this briefcase. There's no way that I'm losing it. And he falls to his death. You know, there's a lot of people that fail to enter the kingdom of God because they love the world too much. And when I say the world, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to sin pleasure, the things that turn our hearts away from God and toward themselves, idols, right? There are so many so-called quote-unquote Christians in the church whose entire pursuit in life is not to keep up with Jesus, but to keep up with the Joneses. And as a result, one day their heart will be exposed and they will be destroyed along with the Joneses, which is my sermon title this afternoon, Destroyed with the Joneses. Now, obviously, we know that not every material thing on earth is bad. That would be a false uh, doctrine, uh, an ancient heresy known as Gnosticism, where everything spiritual is good, but the material is evil. That, that is not true. However, all of us, including myself, have a tendency to prefer family, friends, money, worldly comforts over the things of God. And that's just a fact. We are all guilty of this. Obviously, there is nothing wrong with these things in and of themselves. Many of them are good and are gifts from God. But when it comes to the point where they cause you to neglect God and the things of God, they become evils. Now, in, in a study 
on the famous biblical passages on shepherds titled The Good Shepherd, A Thousand Year Journey from Psalm 23 to the New Testament. There's a scholar named Ken Bailey who describes the nature of David's requests in Psalm 23, the shepherd psalm. He says, the psalmist has a very basic set of wants that the shepherd provides for his sheep. That list includes food, drink, peace, rescue when lost, freedom from fear and death, a sense of being surrounded by God's grace, and a permanent dwelling place in the house of God. Notice that that list does not include an ever rising mountain of material possessions. That is completely absent from that list in Psalm 23. But by praying for these things, the sheep knows that only with the help of the shepherd can he obtain the holy desires for his limited list of basic wants and needs. Now, I don't know who needs to hear this, but contentment and satisfaction in your life is not going to come by way of you getting everything that you want, by you getting complete control over your life, by your circumstances and your and your problems and all the different situations and the different things in your life that are out of order coming into place, that's not going to bring contentment or satisfaction or happiness or joy or anything else. The only thing that brings that is when we only want for our lives what God wants in our lives. When God's will is your will, you will get your will. And so what I want to teach this afternoon, the tattoo for the heart, is this. For the true believer, Jesus is worth everything they are afraid of losing. Let me say that again. For the true believer, Jesus is worth everything they are afraid of losing. Now, the question, how can I find total satisfaction in Christ? How? I want to give you three steps toward total satisfaction, okay, in Christ. And the first is going to be Read the word in order to understand the word. That's going to be verse 15 and verse 2. I mean, verse uh, 16.2, read the word in order to obey the word. And then the last two verses, point three, request that God would remove your idols. Read the word to understand the word. Read the word to obey it and request that God would remove your idols. Beginning at point number one. Read the word in order to understand the word. Verse 15, once again. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Now, he's saying, let the reader seek understanding. Okay? Now, that's not added there by the translators. That's something that most likely Jesus said himself. Now, Total satisfaction comes from total understanding. Okay, and don't, don't understand satisfaction to mean perfection. It means acceptable. Okay. Total satisfaction comes from total understanding. You cannot find satisfying answers from God with limited information. You just can't. All the questions that you have the practical questions that you have about life, about God, about different things are found in the word, but you're only going to get a satisfying answer that, that, that comforts your soul and that makes you walk away saying, okay, I, I, I get it, God. Thank you for that answer. You're only going to get that if you understand the word of God, not just reading it, not just coming to it whenever you have problems, but studying it so that when you come around to wanting answers, you know how to find them. And the ones that you get are adequate. They satisfy the soul. Now, satisfying answers from understanding begin with understanding context first and foremost. You have to understand the context of a passage. What's the background? What's happening culturally and grammatically in this particular passage? Again, I'm not talking about uh, perfect, but acceptable. Answers only come by way of understanding the context. 
So, for example, here in this passage, the context is that Jesus is answering the questions of the disciples, right? They were asking about when these things are going to happen, when the temple's going to be destroyed, you know, when the signs of his coming, when he's returning, when is the end, yada, 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 right? And so Jesus is now answering. But in order for him to give, for him to give them satisfying answers, he has to give them context. He has to take them back to the Old Testament in order for them to receive proper understanding. He's going to have to take them back to Daniel in the Old Testament, an old prophet. See, context is king. Context, context, context. The scripture interprets the scripture. Just like only diamond can cut diamond, only scripture can interpret scripture. We call that the analogy of scripture. The Bible interprets itself. Now, if they understand the context, it will bring them much comfort. That's what eschatology does. The study of the last things, really, the, the main reason we study it is because it's our great hope. When we talk about hope in the Christian life, nothing brings more hope than eschatology, the coming of Christ, waiting for him to return. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, then I'm toast. Because this eschatology stuff is super confusing and I don't understand none of it. So I'm not gonna, there's no, I'm not gonna have no hope whatsoever because I don't get this stuff. Well, let me say first that eschatology is hard for everybody. Okay, nobody understands this uh, perfectly or, or even right away. I've been studying this stuff for over 12 years and I, and I still don't have it down pat. It, it takes a long time to understand these things. I don't know whoever gave you the impression that you were gonna understand this stuff by the first sermon that you heard about it. It, it, it doesn't work that way. It takes time. You're, you're, you're not gonna understand this stuff perfectly today. You're gonna understand more, however. You're gonna get closer and closer, little by little. And as you continue to study, in a year or two, you're gonna be like, man, this stuff's easy. I don't know why, not all of it, but some of it's gonna start to become pretty simple for you. There's always gonna be those things that are extremely difficult that even the best scholars can agree on. But the, the general framework is going to start to become pretty clear to you. And this is just one step closer in that direction. So let's understand what Jesus is saying here, for it brings comfort. First, what is the abomination of desolation? Well, generally speaking, an abomination is an act of hatred. So in this context, an abomination is an act of um, hatred toward God, doing something, you know, sacrilegious, something that is abominable, something that is unthinkable against the holy God, right? And desolation is obviously to leave vacant. So the, the, the phrase is literally the abomination that causes desolation. Okay, what is it? Well, take a wild guess. When Obama was president of this nation, guess what dispensationalists were saying is the abomination of desolation. We've become an abomination to God. Now, what did Daniel say? What exactly did Daniel say anyway? Well, in Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8, and of course I forgot to put a marker in my Bible. Daniel chapter 8, verse 13 it says, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the speaker, How long will these events of this last vision last? The regular sacrifice, the rebellion that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and of the army to be trampled. Okay? Now, Notice that the questions that Daniel records there are the same as the questions that the disciples asked. And so Jesus is saying, if you understand that these questions have already been uh, asked in Scripture, if you find the answer to that, you're going to find the answer to your question, because they're essentially the same thing. Now, again, it's important to understand that the book of Daniel, particularly chapters 9 through 12, record Daniel's visions. God gives Daniel visions about the end times. Uh, again, we can't get into all of it right now, but the visions include a statue, 
And, and it also includes uh, 70 weeks of years, right? And just to cut it short, the last part of that vision, the last 70th week, is what records the, ve the very end. Okay, but the visions include everything involving uh, future prophecy. That's why Daniel is so relevant in these uh, types of discussions. Now, what Daniel is, is, is seeing here, the questions that these, that these angels are, are talking about, first start off with, how long will the events of this last vision last? In other words, the last part, how long is that going to take? And it says the regular sacrifice, the rebellion that makes desolate, and the giving over the sanctuary and the army to be trampled. What, what he is, what, what's being asked here is how long will God tolerate the rebellion of the Jews until he comes in and makes their home desolate? Remember Jesus said, your house has been left to you desolate. And we spoke of that, how that refers to the temple and God no longer being in the temple. They worshiped there. God was going to remove himself. Okay. So that was judgment. God was finally done with Israel. He was like, not entirely, but he was done with the people at that time for, re for rejecting his, their Messiah. And so back then, Daniel's asking, okay, so the Messiah is going to come. His own people are going to reject him. How long are you going to tolerate that rejection before you make their house desolate? That's what's being asked here. Okay. How long? Then, when will their rebellion against you leave the temple desolate? So, there is going to be an abomination that leaves the temple desolate. Okay, the abomination, the act of hatred against God, is, what, is what's going to make God leave. Okay? So, the abomination is the, the, the Israelites' hypocritical worship that eventually causes God to send an army to destroy the temple and trample it and then nobody's going to be in the temple not God, not even Jews because the temple is going to be gone completely so when will that happen? has it happened already? yes, it has happened already it happened in 70 AD we are not looking forward for that happening anymore if on, in Luke the gospel, the gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 20 through 22, it says, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that its desolation has come near. Let, I'm going to pause right there. This is a parallel account. Luke is recording the same thing Matthew is recording. But notice that Luke doesn't say, when you see the abomination of desolation, he says, when you see, replace that phrase with, when you see the armies outside of Jerusalem, it's the same thing. The abomination of desolation and the armies outside are the same thing. Because that's the thing that God is going to use to destroy the temple. So it continues. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Those inside the city must leave it. And those who are in the country must not enter it. Same thing. He's saying the same thing. The only difference is that now he's, he's Luke is a little bit more specific and doesn't use Daniel's language of, of abomination, he just gets to the point that says, when you see the armies, flee to the mountains. Matthew says, when you see the abomination of desolation, flee to the mountains. It's the same thing. So the abomination of desolation, or the abomination that leaves desolate, is the hypocritical worship of the Jews, which is like hatred to God. He's like, stop offering me stuff. Stop singing to me. Your worship is like clanging symbols to my ears. I can't stand it. That is what leaves it desolate. And the means by which God uses is Titus' army in 70 AD. If you read the uh, church historian Eusebius, his book, Ecclesiastical History, uh, chapter 3, I believe section 5. If you read Josephus' Wars, you'll find that that happened to a T. Titus came outside the city gates in 70 AD. He ransacked the city, destroyed the temple. Not one stone was left upon another. And the Jews were left in a bloodbath. And the Christians fled to the mountains. It happened already. We're not waiting for anything anymore. All we're waiting for is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's all we're waiting for. 
And that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Christ is going to return in judgment. And if you think Titus' destruction of the city was bad, Christ's destruction of this world is going to be far worse. And unless you're hidden in the wounds of the Savior, there ain't going to be nowhere for you to hide that day. Even the rocks are going to give you up when you try to hide underneath them. It will be an awful day. Now, the salient point is this. We need to mine the word of God to find the mind of God. It is only when we find his mind and we see that his mind is always set upon us that we find comfort from the scriptures. It is only the more we know about the thoughts of God and the thoughts he has toward you and me that that brings comfort. It is not through shallow reading, it is through deep study that we find the comfort and satisfaction that our hearts are looking for. You know why you choose others more over God? Because you know more about other people than you know about him. If you were to put Christ on one side and everything else on the other, a person with a shallow understanding of the scriptures, their heart's going to lean toward those other things. A person that knows who God truly is, there's no way his heart could be inclined to these. He's going to be inclined toward God because they just know he's, he's so much greater. But see, if you don't know what he thinks about you, but you know what your parents think about you, well, of course you're going to love them more. It only, it only makes logical sense that we would love others more than God when we don't understand who God is. Now, some might say, so you're saying that we should neglect our family for the sake of God? No, I'm saying that you should not neglect God for the sake of your family. Now, we get to rejoice that we have the word, we have the, the mind of God in scripture, we have the illumination of the Holy Spirit to help us understand these things, because apart from him, we wouldn't be able to. We have all these things, the word, illumination, for our edification. The question is, do you want to know your Savior? Lack of understanding will lead to lack of satisfaction. Christ is worth everything that you are afraid of losing. Now my second point, read the word in order to obey the word. Verse 16, back in Matthew 24, says, then, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. So again, they were to understand and they were to obey immediately. See, all things in Scripture are important, but not all things are equally urgent. There are certain things that when you disobey, grace is there. And praise God for that because we need it. But there's certain other things that sometimes it's just too late. And one day it will be too late. There will be no chance of repenting anymore. When Christ returns, it'll be over. Now, understanding is not knowledge. Okay, I want to make that clear. Understanding is not knowledge. Understanding is wisdom. Okay? What we seek is not knowledge, but wisdom. What is wisdom? It is knowledge applied to everyday life. So, yeah, you have to have knowledge. Otherwise, how do you know what to obey? But it has to move from the head to the heart and to the hands if it's truly grasped. If you, you don't really understand something until you've lived it out. Okay? Now, understanding is not knowledge, but wisdom. Again, it's the application of knowledge in real life. And uh, again, Eusebius, in his ecclesiastical history, tells us that the Christians who fled, they fled to the city of Pella. Now, most scholars today probably doubt that, that that's actually accurate. Uh, he's probably off because the city of Pella probably could not have housed uh, that many refugees. And the scripture doesn't say they fled to Pella. It just says that they were going to flee to the mountains, so we kind of should just leave it there. But fled they did, and they were saved for obeying. And that's the main point. The, Christ is not so much concerned with theory, but with practice. And, and, and our modern day application is that 
Don't spend so much time studying uh, eschatology in terms of just of, 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 of adding up numbers and, and memorizing charts, but instead make sure that you're watching your life. Make sure that you're ready at all times. All this other stuff is important, but not as important as being ready, as being watchful, as warning other people that Christ is returning. This is urgent. Now, the word of God, we have to remember, is spiritual in nature. That means that it doesn't just hit the head. It's not like any other book that you're reading. It's something that has the power, uh, Hebrews 4.12 says, to pierce down to our very souls. It goes beyond everything and it hits the heart. So that means that the word properly understood is only properly understood when it's hit the brain, the heart, our affections, our will, our volition, our desires. Only then is the word of God truly internalized and understood in the spiritual nature. And only when this happens will you begin to experience God in such a way that he will be satisfying to you. Only then will your heart begin to rest in him and stop wandering around looking for things to rest in. It'll finally find its rest in him, as Augustine once told us. And now the bottom line is that wisdom is the compass by which we navigate life. Without it, we're just like a large ship being tossed to and fro by the winds and waves of life. Without wisdom, you're just always looking for answers. You're always asking questions. You're never satisfied with the answers. You're never content with them. You're never content with God. You're always complaining. You're fine, and then something happens, a little wave comes, and boof, there you go. And then just when you're starting to, uh, uh, you know, get back into, into back on course, a, a, a strong wind comes by, and there you go again in another way, back and forth, back and forth, because you don't have wisdom. You have to get wisdom. There's a reason why companies today are valuing experience over and above degrees. Because while certain professions require degrees, they're starting to find that a lot of these young college kids who have pure uh, head knowledge and no real life experience are pretty worthless in the workplace sometimes, especially at higher levels. So again, I'm not, the, I'm not that dude that says don't study. You know I'm about study. But it ha you have to get experience. That's also a form of knowledge. Experiential knowledge and theoretical knowledge. You need both of them, not just one over the other. They're not at odds with one another. And now somebody might say, yeah, but I do these things, and I, but I'm still not content with what God does and with his answers. I'm always still left angry and wanting. That's because you still want your will, friend. That's what it is. It's not a, you can study and you can get experience, but until you're willing to submit, until you're, until you're ready to surrender that white black God, my heart is yours, you're, you're just wasting your time. Surrender. You must surrender to his will. Only then will you find the satisfaction you're looking for. And praise God that his word changes our desires. Because if all it did was tell us what to do, we would just be angry all day doing it. But what it does is it actually softens our hearts and makes us want those things. So now we're not kicking against the goads all the time. We actually delight in doing the things of God because the word has that kind of power. And praise God for that. Let me ask you this. Are you resisting holy change? Is God growing you and you're just resisting? You're being convicted of the truth. You know that certain ideas that you held to before are wrong and they're not in the scripture and you're just still resisting it for whatever reason because that's a dangerous thing if you are obey the word especially when you don't feel like it that is the main time to obey the word of God is when you don't because that's where, that's where you know you need the most growth it's just like when you go and get a massage certain places hurt more than others because you're tighter in some spots so you, you, you gotta look for the painful points because that's where you have the biggest problem and so when, and when there's certain things that you just don't want to obey, say, this is exactly what I'm going to obey because this is where I have the biggest problem. And this is where a change in my will needs to happen. And remember, Christ is worth everything you're afraid of losing. Point number three, request that God 
would remove your idols. Verses 16 through 17, it says, excuse me, 17 and 18, it says, a man on the housetop must not come down to get things out of his house, and a man in the field must not go back to get his quote. I don't know why I keep saying quote, it's quote. When these individuals were to leave, they were to do it quickly. They couldn't go back for their earthly possessions that they loved. So many people will not move forward and obey because they hold up, but I, 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 I still want this right here. I can't, I can't leave this yet, I'm not ready. I still gotta get drunk with the homies on every Friday night. I can't give that up yet. There's still things that, that as you try to move away, they hold you down like shackles. The love of the world continues to hold certain individuals back from entering the kingdom. Now, this is very parallel and similar to Lot's wife. When Lot and them were to flee uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, as God destroyed it with the pillar of fire, they, they were not to look back. They were like, don't look back. And this was, this was for an analogy for the New Testament. But Paul tells us in Romans that the things of the past were written for our instruction. And so the story of Lot is a very real story. And there's a reason why God did what he did. It was to illustrate the truth for us. Lot's wife looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. And it's an illustration for us that if we keep looking back, we might become toast one day. I saw somebody post a picture of, 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 of some of a salt and pepper shaker get, of, of, of Lot and his wife. Get your, guess one, which one was the wife? I was like, whoever made this, they, they deserve a special place in hell, man. But they were not to look back. Now, these things are extremely problematic, and it is of the utmost importance that we flee from these things. But you know, we can't do it on our own. If we try to do it of our own will, it's gonna be an exercise in futility. We have to ask God to remove our idols. Otherwise, they're gonna defeat us each and every single time. Jesus says, unless I cleanse you, you're gonna remain unclean, right? Because as John Calvin said, our hearts are idol factories. They're just, they're just producing idols day in and day out. As the, the old hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We need the good shepherd with his staff to put that staff around our neck and bring us back. Otherwise, we're toast. You and I are toast. We need to ask for God's grace and prayer to illuminate us, to give us the urgency, the desire to study his word, and the strength to obey it, especially when we don't want to. So remember, to find more satisfaction in Christ, you gotta search the word to understand Christ. And then you gotta experience him. And then you gotta ask him to give you satisfaction because apart from that, it's never gonna happen. And so the challenge that I wanna leave the church today and you individually is this, remain. Just remain in Christ. There are no solutions to look for. We already have the solution. There's nothing to accomplish He's already accomplished it all. It's when we remove ourselves from him that we either become the person that is falling in love with the things of the world or we become that person that thinks that we're doing things in our own strength. And both of those people will slip and fall. So we have to remain content, keeping our gaze on Christ at all times, seeing how he justifies us, seeing the grace that he gives us, and seeing how he walks along with us to obey him and to follow him properly. And if we'll do that as a church, we'll be the type of church that's immovable. We'll remain in place. We're not, we're not going to be tossed to and fro by every different problem that comes either from within the church or outside of it. Because the newspapers right now, they probably got you super worried and depressed. But the word of God brings us back down and gives us peace and anchors our soul. It brings us down and praise God for that good news of the gospel in which we rest. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you to praise you once again, Lord. To give you thanks for this word. 
for, for your, your spirit's presence here that I know has done a work in hearts and minds of people who have sincerely come to hear from you, Lord. Despite my own imperfections, your, wor your word is still powerful. And, and the word doesn't work because of our preaching. Our preaching works because of the word. It has power. It, it pierces beyond bone and marrow. It goes asunder to the very depths of our souls. It penetrates us and hits us in the deepest, in most parts. And I pray that that would be the case for every individual here. Especially if there's anyone here who does not know you. I pray that you would grant them faith and repentance to believe in your son Jesus and to come to him and make him Lord and Savior over their lives. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen.